Thanks, Senator Klobuchar, and thanks for your very thoughtful book, very which deals, thoughtful book, which uh, deals with many of these topics. Many Thank, these you. topics. Thank uh, you. Senator Thune. Uh, Senator Thune. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Kaufman, following the enactment of the TRACE Act in December of 2019, the FTC's seen a drop in robocall complaints. Um, could you elaborate on some of the FTC's recent robocall enforcement actions? Sure. We are engaging quite sure. a lot with the Federal Communications Commission, with the FCC and with DOJ uh, on a number of robocall issues. We've got several cases in litigation, and we have a lot of cases in the pipeline um, that will be challenging more um, bad robocall conduct. So it's an area we are very actively involved in. Area we are very actively involved in. Could you um, speak to the FTC's efforts on engaging on that issue with industry initiatives like the robocall trace back group and whether this public private partnership has been successful in identifying illegal illegal robocallers absolutely it has been a very uh, successful partnership it's been a robust source of leads and helpful information to allow us to, to build successful law enforcement actions so it highly successful highly successful okay good um Justice Breyer's opinion last week regarding the FTC's authority to seek equitable relief cited the Safe Data Act, which is comprehensive privacy legislation I've sponsored with Senators Wicker, Fisher, and Blackburn, as an example of Congress considering providing for a fix to the gap in the FTC's 13B authority. Uh, Mr. Kaufman, in your view, would this particular provision be helpful to the FTC after the Supreme Court's unanimous ruling that the FTC could no longer secure consumer redress in federal courts under the FTC's 13B authority. Absolutely. We really do appreciate the inclusion of 13B reform in the uh, Safe Data Act uh, and very much are uh, very supportive and think it's a very important thing for, for Congress to take up. Mr. Rhodes, I appreciate all the work that 3M has done throughout the pandemic to increase its production of PPE to support individuals and frontline workers uh, in fact, last November, I had the opportunity to visit 3M's manufacturing facility in Aberdeen, South Dakota, to see the expansion of 3M's N95 mass production lines. At the same time, you were increasing your manufacturing capabilities. Scammers were trying to exploit the pandemic by offering a number of fraudulent products. What steps did 3M take to combat fraudulent activity during the pandemic? And can you talk about your partnership with law enforcement officials when identifying fraud? Yes, thank you for the question, for the Senator question, Thune. Thune. So our efforts to address the pandemic really started with getting information out there. We said we established our website, our fraud hotlines to um, both allow um, customers to verify that offers of product were authentic and uh, from uh, authorized 3M distributors. We put online information about how to spot fraud in all of its forms, how to spot counterfeits. Um, we published the list prices for our commonly sold N95 respirators so that customers could identify and avoid inflated pricing. At the same time, um, uh, once we established intakes for reports of suspected fraud, um, we reached out, as I mentioned, um, to the Department of Justice, uh, to state uh, AG's yeah, offices, AG's. to um, DHS, to CBP, to the FBI, um, and started a process of sharing information, of referring reports. We've referred thousands of reports, which has really extended the reach and effectiveness of our actions. We've also brought our own actions in, in uh, 33 lawsuits in courts across the country, and we've been very successful in stopping the unlawful activity, and we've donated all of our recoveries uh, in those cases, monetary recoveries to COVID-19 related uh, charities. We've also um, partnered with uh, online retailers, internet companies to take down tens of thousands of false or deceptive uh, product listings, uh, social media posts, websites. Um, and so it's been a um, really a, a case of addressing fraud, price gouging, um, and counterfeiting from all angles. Uh, Mr. Kaufman, there have been a number of discussions around vaccine passports since the Biden administration took office. Uh, vaccination is key to ending this pandemic, but the idea that a vaccine passport or lack thereof could be used to track or restrict Americans' movement is concerning. I understand several technology companies have been working to develop digital tools or passports, which may be appealing to consumers as they seek ways to facilitate their return to normal activities. 
And while convenient to the consumer, I am concerned about the privacy and security of that health data that the consumer may opt to provide these companies. The FTC taken steps to conduct oversight of the privacy implications of digital vaccine passports. At the moment, we have not done anything publicly about it, but it is an issue that we are very concerned about. Obviously, there are enormous implications Risky involving implications vaccines involving and privacy vaccine issues. And privacy We've issues. also been active in a lot of other health privacy areas. We brought a recent case uh, flow involving uh, an online telehealth app uh, that collected um, a lot of information from uh, hundreds of millions of people. So the issue of health and apps is an area we're very focused on, and I, I think you raise a very important issue that we will be looking at. Looking at. Good. Okay, I'm glad you're going to be looking at it. Thank you, Ms. Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Thune. Uh, and now, Senator Markey. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Mr. 